Um, hi, I'm Lila Al Shanang Al Andalusia, and um, this is the second time I've taught this class. I taught it last year at Penzik, which was super fun. Uh, but this time, at, at least, we're out of the sun. <laughs> um, all right, I uh, I had sort of an interesting experience last night because um, my class notes from last year just up and vanished, so I had to completely rebuild the class. So. It may be a little different than it was last year, um, but I do have slides this time. So let me see if I can get them up as we're getting started. Um, wait, what am I looking for? Screen photos, iCloud Drive. iCloud Drive, that's what I'm looking for. All right. Oh, come on, which one of these is the PDF? Well, here we go. All right. Welcome to Courtesans in the Performing Arts. Um, it's always a little odd for me doing these classes where I, I don't have any like ability to talk to you guys and get feedback as we're going. But if anyone has a question or want, like I don't mind if you interrupt the stream of thought, if you have something you want to contribute or a question or anything. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think you can like raise your hand or something and then one of the moderators can can allow you to, oh, what happened to my screen? Did that go away for everyone else? No, it looks fine to us. We can see your, uh, see your PowerPoint. It's so just fine. weird. It disappeared on my end. Oh. Okay, I, I'm gonna have to stop and start it again because I have no idea what just happened. It, it was as I was trying to look at something. So yeah, now I've got it back. All right. But yeah, so, I'll, I'll keep an eye on your uh, questions, comments, concerns, et cetera, and let you know if anyone's saying anything in chat, raising hands, et cetera. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So the basic premise of this class is um, courtesans have a lot of roles in society. Oh, and I have dogs. Sorry about that. Can you remove the dog? For some reason, she's decided it's a good time to bark. Um, so uh, courtesans... Sure, go ahead. Um, courtesans held a lot of different roles in different places and times, and there have been a lot of different uh, classes to give you an opportunity to learn about uh, their roles as hostesses and their roles as, um, as writers and, and in all sorts of different areas. But my focus, uh, my research focus when it comes to courtesans has always been courtesans in the performing arts. Um, and specifically the role that courtesans played in the development of some of the classical forms that are practiced around the world. Um, courtesans are often written off as having been a minor footnote in history when in fact a lot of the cultural institutions that um, have built in particular um, uh, Europe and Asia were built on the work that was done by courtesans who were performing artists. Um, so we're gonna go with sort of, this is sort of a survey class. So we're gonna go through different, uh, different cultures and talk about their specific courtesans and what they did in the performing arts, how they contributed to the development of those arts, etc. All right, so we're gonna start with ancient Greece. Um, the heteri, I know there's like a million different spellings of heteri, this is the one I decided to go with. Um, the heteri of ancient Greece were extremely accomplished women. Um, they were conversationalists, and they were poets, and musicians, and dancers, and gymnasts. Um, they entertained at uh, important functions. They uh, they were involved in a great deal of performance in the ancient Greek world. We often leave the heteri out of the conversation when we talk about Greek performing arts, largely because from the modern era, we tend to look back with a very myopic lens. We tend to look at ancient Greece and the performing arts and think almost exclusively of Greek theater. Um, and Greek theater was restricted in very specific ways. Um, and because it had religious origins, its development followed uh, uh, fairly carefully prescribed uh, rules and system. 
but the heteri were involved in virtually every other part of the performing arts in ancient Greece. Um, they did play a role in Greek theater as well. Uh, specifically, they danced and sang in the dithyrambic and cyclic choruses that preceded the tragic chorus in Greek theater. Uh, and there is some evidence, although it is not, um, uh, it's not definitive in any way, but there is some evidence that uh, the heteri may have occasionally been involved in Greek theater uh, proper as a, filling in the role of chorus, which is generally played by one to three people, depending on the location and time. So they did play a role in Greek theater, um, but what they were more known for was music and dance. Um, when it comes to music, one of the categories that we hear about are the allotridae. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. My ancient Greek is not really up to standard. Um, uh, Allotrite roughly translates to flute girls, um, but what they played was not actually what we think of in the modern era as a flute. It was a double reed instrument that was more similar to an oboe than a flute. Um, they also played the lyre and the harp, and they frequently were singers and poets. And in ancient Greece, poetry was often accompanied by music. So there's uh, the lines between uh, poetic performance and musical performance were uh, sometimes fuzzy. Um, they were also known for their dancing and their gymnastics abilities, um, and they performed mimetic dances and monodies, which were um, a woman singing and dancing alone, accompanying herself on the cymbals. Um, we don't really have any record of what that looked like. Uh, we have only descriptions of these performances, which is sort of a shame. Um, uh, but we have descriptions and we have these, uh, uh, these art bits that show people playing their flutes and, and their lyres and that sort of thing. Um, I've got a nice little quote here from Women in the Ancient World by James C. Thompson. Uh, and this is an account of a specific performance um, happening at, uh, in the time of Socrates in Greece. Uh, it says, the flute girl performed first, followed by a dancer. When the latter's opening routine was finished, she was given 12 large hoops, which she proceeded to juggle as she resumed dancing. For the final part of this program, a large ring holding upright a number of sharply pointed swords was laid on the floor. The dancer then performed a dazzling series of front and back somersaults into and out of the ring. The men were understandably more than impressed. Socrates, one of the guests, remarked that this proved that, except in matters of physical strength and judgment, women's nature was in no way inferior to a man's. I, of course, am gonna take exception to except in matters of physical strength and judgment, but we'll move on. After the serving of drinks and further conversation, two of the performers returned to act out a meeting of Ariadne and Dionysus, which finished with the two fondling and kissing each other and swearing their mutual love. At that point, the guests declared the evening a great success and headed home with no indication whatever of sexual activity between the guests and performers. Now that last thing was a really interesting point. As we go through uh, the role of courtesans in the performing arts in, in many different cultures, one of the, the themes that keeps repeating itself is that uh, in many cases, courtesans who were entertainers were not necessarily sex workers. Some were, some weren't. Um, and it throws sort of into disarray a lot of our ideas about what a courtesan is, because we, we tend to identify the entire category according to sex work. But I, I think the critical thing to come away with is that many cultures in period viewed entertainers exactly the same way they viewed prostitutes. So there was no, um, there was no need for a social distinction between those things because one was not considered uh, um, more risque than the other. Uh, obviously, there, there also was frequently a erotic element to the performance that courtesans did, but not always. Um, another thing while we're talking about the Greeks that I think is, is sort of important to understand is um, 
in ancient Greece, the category of people who we think of as courtesans includes both free women and slaves. Um, in most times and places, courtesans are explicitly separated from uh, the slave class, but that was not necessarily the case in ancient Greece, which helps our understanding when we're, when we're looking at, um, at documentation from the period, because it's very, very difficult to tell a lot of times whether you're talking about a free person or a slave, whether you're talking about um, a courtesan or uh, someone who came from another culture and was enslaved or something like that. And it, the lines are fuzzy. And it, as most of you probably know, the actual term courtesan never appeared until the Renaissance. So we're we're looking backwards and imposing a later framework on the periods that we're looking at, which is an important consideration. Um, all right, are there any questions on Greece? I see no questions on Greece. I'll pause for a second in case anybody wants to ask anything. All right, we're gonna move on to our next section. So the, our next section is on the courtesans and temple dance crews of India. Now, in India, our categorizations get a little bit tricky. Um, there are three specific groups of uh, courtesan-like figures that I'm going to discuss. Um, the Devadasi, the Rajadasi, and the Tawaif. This has been an area of study for me for most of my life. I, I grew up in, uh, in a Hindu home and I, um, I, I learned the arts that are now considered Devadasi arts, the, the classical Indian uh, dance forms very early. So um, this is something I, I have sort of a personal experience of as opposed to ancient Greek heteri. Um, ooh, I see a question. What did a harp look like in ancient Greece? Um, I believe most of the ancient Greek harps were what we would now call a lap harp. They were, they were small. Um, and I'm not really sure if there's a, a clear distinction between a harp and a lyre in ancient Greece, but it's not my specific area of specialty, so I'd have to look into it a little bit more deeply for you. All right, back to India. Devadasi, Rajadasi, and Tolai. So the first of these categories is the Devadasi, and the Devadasi are um, the oldest of the three categories, which is one of the reasons we're starting there. Um, <clears throat> today, there is a great deal of objection when you talk about David Dossi and connect them to courtesans. Um, and the reason for that is rife with colonialist history and it has a lot to do with the oppression of uh, Indian classical forms by the British government during uh, the British colonial era. era. Um, in reality, they walked a very specific line. Devadasi were temple dancers. In some places, they were also temple prostitutes, but not everywhere. Um, but in any case, they held a position in society that is very parallel to the position that we think of courtesans holding, which is to say, they, uh, they were technically from a very low class most of the time, but through their role as Devadasis, they ended up in a special outsider class that was able to interact with the upper classes, but wasn't of them, which is very typical of how we see courtesans throughout history. Um, now, in, in the case of the Devadasi, they were married to a god in the same manner that Catholic nuns are married to Jesus. Um, there was a ceremony, it was a whole thing. Um, and often they were married to a god at, at like eight or nine years old. Um, that didn't mean that they were immediately um, put into public service. It was just that that was the level um, at which the dedication took place. So after being dedicated to a god, and, and it could be, you know, any god that there was a temple to in India, um, we see more Devadasis were dedicated to either Shiva or Krishna than anything else, but there are, um, there are also Devadasis who are dedicated to Agni, the, the god of fire, um, or to Chandra, the god of the moon. There, there are uh, variations in, um, throughout India as far as 
who the David Dossie were dedicated to. After that dedication, they served in the temple and their roles in the temple could be anything from, you know, someone who cleaned the temple every day um, to someone who was a featured performer at, um, at religious celebrations. A lot of religious celebrations contain artistic components that have to be fulfilled and those roles were fulfilled by David Dossie. Now, in many places, the David Dossie also served as a sort of religious prostitute, what we would think of as a temple prostitute, um, similar to some of the, uh, the early cults in Roman Greece. Um, our information on that is relatively, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's thin. We have, we have bits and pieces. We know that it happened, but we don't necessarily know in what context and, uh, and we don't know how widespread it was. Um, but even if they were not actually acting as sex workers, as you will find over the course of this class, they were serving in the capacity that most performing courtesans served, which is to say they were acting as a source of entertainment um, as well as a, a, a religious element in, um, in a public setting in which women would not have been welcome. One of the, the themes that runs through our understanding of courtesans throughout history is that uh, a class, an important and, and, and stratified social class of courtesans who serve the upper classes emerges in very specific uh, social conditions. And the social conditions where it tends to thrive are conditions where society is extremely stratified and where women are not allowed to uh, participate in public life in almost any way. Because when that happens, there ends up opening up this, uh, this vacuum in society that has to be filled by someone because the men of that status do want to be entertained by women but when it's become completely taboo for most women to be involved in that career in that in any sort of way or or to serve other functions to serve um in in well we'll, we'll get to renaissance italy later but to serve as, as an example here in italy um courtesans were necessary in order to run a fancy dinner because men couldn't be expected to do that kind of work but women weren't allowed to interact with men so courtesans fill this liminal space. And that's what we see happening across cultures. So when we're dealing with the Devadasi in India, we're dealing with a society in which women were held to a very um, high standard of modesty in most cases. But there were roles that they needed to play, especially religiously, that had to be filled by a special sort of othered class of women, um, which in this case was the Devadasi. Now, as we move later in, in time, as we move into um, the Muslim rule of India, uh, the Devadasi tradition had sort of a split off that came, and that was the introduction of the Raja Dasi. Now, where Devadasi um, means servant to the god, Raja Dasi means servant to the king. Um, and I'm not exactly sure if I'm correct about the translation, I'm not sure what Dasi means. But Deva is, uh, is God and Raja is King and Dasi is either servant or dancer and I genuinely can't remember which. Um, either way, the Raja Dasi were dedicated to a king rather than a god and their primary role in society was very much like the role of the Deva Dasi. They were, um, uh, they took part in religious celebrations. They um, uh, performed in, in public spaces, but in this case, they were performing and, and involved in uh, the goings-on of the court rather than the goings-on of the temple. Um, this sometimes meant entertaining foreign dignitaries. It sometimes uh, meant performing at Hindu ceremonies, which the, um, the leaders at that time weren't involved in, but did allow. So there were, there were a lot of complicated ways that the Raja Dasi acted as intermediaries between the predominantly Hindu public 
and the uh, the Mughal um, Muslim uh, practicing Muslim leadership of India at that time. Uh, the third group that we're going to talk about are the Tawaii. And they were explicitly courtesans. They were courtesans who served the aristocratic classes in the Mughal Empire. They coexisted with Rajadasi. So you would have a Rajadasi and a Tawaiif in the same location, perhaps, but the Rajadasi was dedicated specifically to the king, and the Tawaiif was a free agent. Uh, she was a courtesan. Um, she was not uh, married to anyone, king or god. Um, and she was able to participate in society um, in a more normalized way than you would get with the Devadasi or the Rajadasi. Uh, all right, let me see what else we have here. So while their primary duties were related to dance, Devadasi and Rajadasi were also trained as musicians. Most of them were able to sing and could accompany themselves on a classical instrument, most commonly the sitar or the veena. Um, both of which are uh, sort of lute-like instruments with a long neck. Um, the Devadasi tradition dates to at least the third century in the Gupta Empire. Our first uh, reference is in the Megadutta of Kalidasa, which is a, a famous Sanskrit poem. It's currently dated to the third century, but I have seen estimates ranging from the fifth century BC to the eighth century, so it's not entirely clear. Um, but that's a problem we get with a lot of these types of sources. Uh, the children of Devadasi and Rajadasi were considered legitimate due to their marriage to either a god or a king, respectively, which I think is a, one of the, um, the factors that it tends to support the idea that many of them were also acting as sex workers. Um, but that's sort of a complicated issue. If any of you are interested in that down the road, I'm happy to have a sort of longer conversation about that. Uh, Tawaif were also accomplished entertainers. When we think of Devadasi and Rajadasi, we think first and foremost of their role in the performing arts. When we think of Tawaif, we tend to think of them as sex workers first and performers second. But in fact, they contributed substantively to the Northern Indian musical, theatrical and dance traditions, as well as to the Urdu liter literary tradition. Um, there are a number of very important Hawaii poets and, uh, and essayists. They're, um, they specifically developed a performance style, still performed, uh, called the Mujra, which was a, um, a very popular style in the Mughal Empire. It contains elements of Katak dance, which is a Northern Indian dance style, um, Tumris, which is a, a music and dance style in Northern India, uh, Ghazals, which are love poetry that if any of you are familiar with, um, with Arab musical traditions, you may be familiar with the Ghazal. It's a love song that originated in the Arabic world and various types of poetry. Um, the Mujra was what you would call a total entertainment. Um, in some areas, it contained elements that we would consider exotic dance, which is to say erotic dancing that sometimes involved partial nudity. Um, we don't have a lot of details on it beyond that, uh, but we do know that all of these practices were sort of modified and, and made more modest over time. And today, the practices that were associated with Rajadati and Devadasi and Tawai in our period um, have become legitimate classical forms that are taught to, uh, to especially young women in India from the time they're six or seven years old. Obviously the sexual components have been sort of weeded out over the years. Um, that was aided largely by the colonial British and their criminalization of, uh, of the Devadasi practices. But again, that's a little post period, so just a hint there. Um, if we have time at the end, I have another presentation that I can like stick up on the board for anyone who's interested that gets into the specific uh, Indian classical dance forms that were developed mostly by uh, by these early courtesans. Um, but that's sort of an extra in depth 
thing and we'll get to it if we get to it. We'll see how long everything else takes. All right, our next group is the Kisang, also known as the Ginyeo. I apologize if I'm butchering any of these pronunciations. Um, Korean is not my specialty. Uh, but the Kisang and the Ginyeo are, are the courtesans of Korea. Um, the pictures I have here, like I had for the, uh, the Indian courtesans earlier, are obviously post-period, but a lot of the stylistic elements have, have been passed on through the years. So the Kisang rose to prominence during the Goryeo dynasty, which is relatively early in period, early to middle period. Uh, 935 to 1394 were the years of the Goryeo dynasty, and the Kisang appear fairly early in the dynasty. Um, they were chosen from the Cheon Min class, which is the lowest class in Korean society. And they usually came from slave or outcast families. There is some evidence that some of the first Kisang may have been captured from nomadic Manchurian tribes. Um, but it, it's somewhat sparse. So it's, a, it's an interesting theory that a lot of anthropologists believe in quite strongly, but there's only a small amount of evidence to back it up right now. Um, the Kisang provided entertainment to the men of the upper classes. They were trained in music, dance, art, poetry, and conversation skills. And like some of the earlier courtesans we talked about, they did not all engage in sex work, although many of them did. Um, also, like some of the classes we, we spoke about earlier, they were a liminal class. They came from the very lowest classes in Korean society, but they were elevated by their status as courtesans and, and their role in uh, interacting with the aristocratic classes um, to a special kind of othered category in which they were simultaneously held um, almost in the same regard as the nobility and also viewed as the lowest of the low. This is a very common paradox that occurs when we deal with courtesans historically. Um, because there was often so much shaming that was associated with sex work. We see it still to this day. Um, and yet they could rise to roles of tremendous prominence and influence and, uh, and were often able to make artistic contributions that free women or, um, or noble women were not because they were so restricted by the society they lived in. So we see that same sort of other category when we deal with the Kisai. Um, during the Goryeo dynasty, uh, especially towards the end of that dynasty and as we move into, uh, I don't think I wrote it down, but I believe it's the Jobian dynasty, um, the Kisang were frequently trained in academies, which were called Gyobang. In the Gyobang, they learned to perform in specific musical styles uh, known as the Danga and the Soga. Um, and those who were trained at the Gyobang were exclusively court entertainers. They did not have assignations out of the court. Their role in society was tied to the government, which we're going to get into actually even more on the next page here. Um, but over time, their role as court entertainers bled into other roles in court. They became involved in diplomacy and statecraft and um, ended up being very, very influential at a very high level. Um, now, one of the interesting things about the Kisang is that they, they themselves were not technically slaves, but their services were owned by the government. And they couldn't work for anyone else without their services being purchased from the government for quite a lot of money. So they were, um, they held again a sort of strange liminal class in which they both were and were not slaves. Um, and in order to be freed, someone had to pay the bill which since they worked for the government, unlike courtesans and a lot of other times and places, they didn't tend to become independently wealthy through their job as a Kisai because 
they were put up by the government and then they worked for the government and and that was how it worked it's a closed loop um they could uh, their, their careers were very short uh this actually isn't in the class notes here but they most kissing were retired by the time they were 22 years old so they had a lot of life left when they were no longer doing that work but even at that point their services continued to be owned by the government so the way that a lot of kissing transitioned into life after being a, a government kissing was to find a patron but the patron had to buy their services from the government they had to they had to pay a, a set amount of money to sort of free them from government control and then at that point they became essentially the concubine of a patron and they were again in a semi enslaved status um so that's challenging uh i would not necessarily have uh, have wanted to live that life but the the Kisang were nonetheless very well known for their involvement in the arts. They were extremely well trained. They helped to develop a lot of the musical forms um, that became classical musical forms in Korea. Um, and there also were some interesting uh, regional differences. The Kisang of, of the region known as Jinju were known for their performance of the Geomu which was a traditional sword dance that is believed to date to the 7th century. There were some really cool 19th century plates of, uh, of the kissing of Jinju performing this sword dance, and they, they look pretty wild. Um, the kissing of the Honam region were trained in Pansori. Um, I had a, a classmate when I was working on my master's degree who uh, was a Pansori performer, so I know um, I, I, I've had the, the fortune, the, the sort of privilege of being able to experience a Pansori performance. Um, it, it's not something that is available very easily outside of Korea. Um, today, we associate the Pansori actually with being performed by shaman women. But in period, in the early, uh, in early years of Pansori especially, they were also performed by the Kisang of the, the Honam region. So Pansori is a, a theater storytelling form that is performed by a singer and a drummer. It includes physical movement, um, but it's sort of, it's like a, a one woman show, <laughs> a one woman show with accompaniment that um, lasts from three to six hours. It's not actually documented until the 17th century, but we do know that it was developed by kissing in the 17th century. Uh, one of the most famous kissing that we've come across is uh, Huang Jini, who was a, a late period, uh, a, a late period figure. She was born in 1506 and died in 1560. She's also known as Nyongwal, which means bright moon, and that was her courtesan name. Um, I know some people uh, in the courtesans guild actually also have a given name and a courtesan name. That was a practice that was widespread in Korea. Um, Huang Jini was known as a poet, and uh, her there's, there's a verse call, form called the Sijo, and hers are considered the most beautiful ever written. Um, she is also known for her musical arrangements for the, uh, the Korean zither, which is called the Gale Mungo. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right again. Um, Unfortunately, most of her sejo have been lost to time. So we don't have a, a huge body of work to look at of hers. But if you're interested uh, and you look her up online, uh, Huang, Huang Jini uh, does have at least, I think, 10 or 12 poems that are available currently. Uh, and they're all translated. So uh, you won't have any trouble finding a, a translation. All right. Moving on. All right, the next category is Japanese courtesans. Japanese courtesans are a little bit tricky when we're talking about period because most of our information about the, the Japanese courtesan classes starts in 1600. Um, the earliest incarnation of the courtesan tradition began with the Saburuko 
who, sorry, Saburuko, who were serving girls, who were young women that were displaced by war, who made a living as prostitutes. And the more educated among them became high-end entertainers for the upper classes. That's a practice that dates back, uh, I believe, to the sixth or seventh centuries. Um, at that point, we're dealing with a um, not entirely uh, defined class. It, it, they were, they came from a lot of different backgrounds. Some of them came from uh, educated backgrounds and some of them came from very, very poor peasant backgrounds. There was a wide range and, and what they came into it knowing affected what sort of career they had. Um, but during the 16th century, the shogunate mandated the creation of walled-in pleasure centers called yukaku. Uh, and they also created a detailed hierarchy of yujo, uh, which were prostitutes in, uh, in Japan. And there, I believe it was somewhere between seven and 12 ranks, and I don't remember what all of them were. But the highest rank that it was possible to achieve was the, the rank of taiyu. And the Taiyu were very skilled entertainers. They performed uh, music and dance. They were known for uh, uh, many different types of performance and they were extremely cultured, um, extremely educated women. Uh, perhaps most interestingly, they developed a style of entertainment that started as erotic skits and dances, and it was called kabuku. And if that sounds similar to another Japanese performance style, it is because kabuku is in fact the root form from which kabuki theater was derived. Kabuku translates to to be wild and outrageous. So this uh, this erotic. Uh, entertainment known as kabuku uh, eventually formed into um, a very specific set of performance practices that we now think of as kabuki. Now that may be surprising to you if you know anything about Japanese culture because kabuki today is only performed by men. Um, this is a pattern like many other patterns that we see play out uh, across a lot of different portions on classes in different times and places. Um, is that courtesans introduce a style of entertainment and then when it becomes legitimized, it gets taken away from them. And that's what happened here. Kabuki theater uh, was wildly popular, initially very much with the lower classes. Um, for a Western eye, we tend to think of Kabuki as being very high class entertainment, but in the context of Japanese theater, no theater is considered formal entertainment for the upper classes. And Kabuki theater is considered sort of entertainment for the masses. So at a certain point, there was, uh, we started going through a little bit of a back and forth with Kabuki, and this is how Kabuki ended up in the hands of men only. Um, a later shogun was upset about Kabuki theater because he felt that it encouraged prostitution, and he was against prostitution. And this, this is not, by the way, a consistent view of, of Japanese shoguns. This was one specific shogun who, um, who had fairly unusual views in this regard. So he was very bothered by the amount of prostitution that, that seems to be connected with the Kabuki theater. And in response, he restricted its performance only to men. Well, the immediate and, in my opinion, very predictable result of that was that the men who were performing kabuki theater became prostitutes. And, and then there was a huge uptick in gay male prostitution that happened in that period. And the shogun was even more upset by the rise in gay male prostitution. And his response then was to try to curb that trend by requiring all kabuki actors to wear their hair in a really specific hairstyle that involved like shaving the sides and a knot on the top. The idea was that he didn't think it was an attractive hairstyle. And he required that all kabuki actors had to be at least 35 years old and had to have this specific kind of ugly hairstyle. 
this did absolutely nothing to curb the prostitution that was associated with Kabuki. What happened instead is that that really weird hairstyle became all the rage among the upper classes. And, uh, and that is how, as, as courtesans, we frequently influence fashion in unexpected ways. Nonetheless, those restrictions held to this day. Um, there is a new movement that has emerged really in the last 10 years of women uh, who are trying to take back Kabuki as an art form that women had a hand in creating. Um, but it's not a very well supported movement right now. I'd like to see that change, but um, the vast majority of, of the Japanese cultural elite are very attached to their traditionalist view, which goes back only so far and no farther. Um, and they want to keep the, uh, the requirements in place. So just a little bit of modern politics as it, as it overlays our history. So the Taiyu and later the Oiran um, were also instrumental in the development of classical Japanese dance forms, uh, especially Jintamai which was, uh, what is, a dance style that incorporates fan dances, a lot of circular movements, and pantomime. Um, by the way, a, a quick explanation of terminology. Um, if, any, if, if anyone here is more well-versed on Japanese courtesans than me, feel free to jump in. But in general, the Taiyu predated the, the existence of a class that we now call the Oiran by not a lot, but by at least a couple of decades. But then when the Oiran, when Oiran became a, a, a term and sort of a, a standard category, the Taiyu remained the highest class of Oiran. So the terminology is a little fuzzy, but um, like I said, if anyone is more familiar than me, feel free to jump in. Um, the Taiyu and the Oiran were also involved in the development of a dance style called Bon Odori, which is a folk dance performed in the summer months. And it, frequently the, the name of the form is just sort of shortened these days to Odori. Um, I grew up in Hawaii uh, with a very, very large Japanese population, and I studied Odori for nine years. So um, it, it remains a really important dance form that is practiced uh, throughout the areas that, that traditional Japanese culture continues to survive. Um, now, interesting thing about Oiran, the Oiran is actually a post-period categorization. It first appeared around the year 1600. Um, Oiran specifically were high-class courtesans, and they considered themselves entertainers first and prostitutes second. And that's very important to the distinctions that were built into the, the Japanese, um, the, the class system that was sort of imposed inside the, the courtesans' guilds, as it were. Um, it was, uh, it, it was a, a separating mark between the, um, the less educated and, and frequently the people who were from uh, lower class families compared to the courtesans uh, of the Oiran class who frequently came from families that, that at least had a history of having had political power and or money. Um, if you know a lot about Japanese dynastic history, um, individual families went in and out of favor and as such, might be very wealthy and influential at one point, and then a hundred years later, completely impoverished. But even if they were completely impoverished, they retained a level of um, uh, educational expectation and cultural expectation that came from their status as sort of fallen nobles. So a lot of Oiran came from that class. Um, and it was very important to them that they separate their role in society from that of people who came from the lower classes, which is largely a result of what a very 
very economically stratified society Japan had. Um, so Oiran were masters of a really wide range of art forms. By today's standards, they, they were pretty astonishing, actually. Um, they were expected to master the Chado, which is the Japanese tea ceremony. If you've ever witnessed a Japanese tea ceremony or been a part of one, it is a classical performance art all on its own. Um, ikebana, which is flower arranging and calligraphy, all very important to um, what was considered necessary to be a cultured person in Japan. But they also generally played a wide range of instruments. Uh, unlike the, uh, the heterai, for example, who mostly played any instrument, which might be a lyre and might be a flute, um, the Japanese courtesans, the oiran, were expected to play all of these instruments. They were expected to play the koto, which is a string zither, the shakuhachi, which is a wooden flute, the suzumi, which is a hand drum, the shamisen, which is a long-necked lute-like instrument, and the kokyu, which is a bowed instrument. They were expected to master all of those instruments. Um, very few people in our society today are multi-instrumentalists in the way that oiran were expected to be uh, as a general standard of practice. Um, and they were also expected to be masters of the Jinsamai style of dance. Some of them were singers, but not all. Um, so that's, that's our courtesans of Japan. Oh, and let me give two seconds uh, of attention to the geisha. Geisha were not courtesans. It is a largely misunderstood division, but there was in fact quite a lot of rivalry between the geisha and the oiran. Um, geisha are post period, and also in general, they were not in fact sex workers at all. Um, and they weren't considered a part of that same system that, uh, that the oiran and the taiyu specifically within that group were, were categorized under. So um, that's just a, a largely misunderstood uh, situation for those of us in the West. All right, I am going to move on. I may have actually scheduled more time for this class than I needed, but that means we'll have some time for questions at the end. All right, the courtesans of Safavid Persia. So uh, we really see much more about the courtesans of, of Persia after 1600 than before. We've got some information during the 16th century, but the most comprehensive information we have is from between uh, like 1580 and 1640. So if you're willing to use that 50 year extension that some people uh, like to use in, in our SCA context, it, it does help in this study. Um, regardless, you can actually look at those sources from the early 17th century and infer backwards. There's no guarantee uh, that things are, are the same when we read about them uh, as they were 20 or 30 or 40 years earlier, but it's likely that a lot of these practices had already been in place for a while. So courtesans in south of Persia are a super interesting category. My persona is actually a, a south of the Persian courtesan. I know I'm in Romans today, but that's because it's too hot. Um, but my persona is, is a south of the Persian courtesan. And, uh, yeah, I know, it's a terrible picture. I apologize, Urta team. Um, I, uh, I had to throw this together in the middle of the night because I couldn't find my old class notes. And uh, you are correct, and thank you for correcting me. This is actually an Ottoman uh, picture, and it's an 18th century depiction. Most of my pictures in here are not period pictures, which I, 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 I hope I've made very clear. Um, but in this case, it's actually the wrong garb, so I apologize. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the courtesans of Safavid Persia were um, a very interesting category. Um, Safavid Persia had a extreme, uh, no, no, I, I don't mind Urta team, it's all good. <laughs> um, the courtesans of Safavid Persia had a, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Uh, let me find where I was. Um, women in South of Persia were extremely separated from men. The, uh, the degree of separation was so extreme that they actually stopped 
the practice of having someone climb up high in a tower to issue the call to prayer for fear that the, the man who was doing that might see over someone's fence and accidentally catch a glimpse of a woman. Um, it was such an incredibly divided society that uh, they had an entire women's economy. It's actually really interesting. It, it, it ends up coming all the way around to this sort of feminist utopia on the other side, um, uh, simultaneously existing, because since women were not allowed to have contact with men in almost any capacity, there were women in almost all of the professions. There were women doctors, there were women lawyers, there were, there were women in, in almost every part of society. Um, and one day a week in, uh, in Persia, well, in, in Isfahan specifically, one day a week was the ladies' day, and all the men were required to stay home so that the women could go out, and the whole marketplace was transitioned into a women's marketplace. So this extremely divided society created a vacuum, a and in that vacuum, um, what was needed was someone who could bridge these worlds in some way. And that's what courtesans frequently do. They are, they are people who bridge worlds. And the courtesans of Safavid Persia were uh, involved a great deal in court entertainment. They, were, um, they, they helped to run feasts at, um, at the Shah's home. I'm sorry, my, my throat is a little dry. Um, the courtesans were, were involved in any sort of public event that might benefit from the presence of women, but to which women, respectable women, couldn't be expected to go. Now, one of the really interesting things about the courtesans of South of Persia is that they were religiously sanctioned. Um, at, at the time, the type of Islam that was practiced in South of Persia was, uh, they were Shiites, but they were specifically a very, very liberal branch of um, uh, I've lost the word. I'm so sorry. Anyway, they were, they were a liberal branch of Shiites. I can't remember the name of the specific branch. I'm just having a blank moment right now. Um, but they had interpreted a, a certain aspect of the Quran to make it possible for women to contract temporary marriages. And this interpretation um, opened up the door for a legally sanctioned form of prostitution practiced by high-end courtesans in Persia, in which the courtesan and her client contracted a temporary marriage that was the only marriage that the woman could be involved in at a single time. So, so basically being a courtesan in, in South of the Persia from the perspective of a sex worker meant that you had one relationship and then you had another relationship. It was, it was serial monogamy rather than being a, um, uh, a single courtesan servicing many clients situation. Now, the result of this is that only the most in-demand courtesans were actually sanctioned. Because if you, were, if you weren't able to command a very large amount of money, um, you couldn't afford to only have one client at a time. That was a privilege of the very rich. So there was, of course, um, a, a hierarchical, you know, range of courtesans in, in Persia, ranging from those who served uh, in taverns and, um, uh, and on the street versus those who commanded, you know, large amounts of money and were able to, uh, to take on this very specific temporary marriage practice. Um, it's called a muta, although I didn't put that in the notes. Um, one of the things that is most important about the muta is that 
if a courtesan had contracted a temporary marriage, then if she became pregnant, her child was considered legitimate. Now, another important thing to remember when we're talking about the idea of these temporary marriages is that it was also legal for men to have many wives. So a man could contract a temporary marriage even if he was already married. Uh, that was irrelevant to the question. Uh, a woman was only allowed to have one partner at a time, and that was for the reason of being able to identify who the father of a child was. Um, because of that, there was also a, a grace period sort of on either end of, uh, of a contract. You couldn't, um, the courtesan had to practice uh, celibacy for a specific period of time before and after each marriage in order to guarantee there would be no confusion about the paternity of a child. So uh, these courtesans who, um, who held this very interesting position in society in which they were actually not, not relegated um, to a sub-legal life the way they were in many places um, meant that courtesans in Persia had, had quite a lot of freedom. Um, the, the wealthiest courtesans lived on the Chahar Bagh uh, and had pleasure palaces um, uh, or pleasure uh, estates in, on the Chahar Bagh, which was the fanciest Beverly Hills-like street in Isfahan. Uh, and the most successful courtesans were entertainers. They were highly skilled entertainers and they were responsible for the majority of court entertainment. There were sometimes uh, some non-courtesans who were male musicians, um, but they weren't generally the most featured entertainment. The, the most um, uh, important entertainment in South of the Persia were the dancers and singers. Uh, and those were predominantly uh, a role filled by these courtesans. Now, one of the things that's really interesting uh, about Persian courtesans is that even unattractive women could rise to the highest levels uh, even if they were sufficiently skilled. There are specific records. Um, I, I read a quote about one particular courtesan who was described as having the face of a horse but the voice of an angel. Uh, apparently that is a, a, a comparison that was made even in the 17th century. Uh, it's not, unfortunately, a contemporary, a, a, a period quote. It's just post-period. But um, the interesting thing about that is that this is, once again, at the highest levels, some courtesans weren't actually sex workers at all. And, um, and those that were, weren't necessarily required to uh, conform to the conventional standards of beauty at the time if they were accomplished enough in the arts. Uh, they were valued very highly for their contributions to the arts. And of course, the other aspect of that is that even if a courtesan was under contract to one specific man, she could still perform at court and um, fulfill this other aspect of being a courtesan. She could, she could perform anywhere she wanted. She just couldn't sleep with other men during that period. So um, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunity to still make independent choice uh, in her life, even after uh, contracting a muta. As I said, not all courtesans were sex workers. Um, some were exclusively entertainers, but they shared exactly the same status, whether or not they were sex workers. It made no difference to how they were seen publicly. Uh, a, uh, an entertainer was breaking so many of the rules of modesty that they had already put themselves fully into a class that couldn't be divided from, uh, from the sex worker class in, uh, under the moors of, uh, of Persian society at that time. Um, they were independent contractors and they could choose their own clients. They were not owned by the government like the Kisai. They were not regulated by a, um, a, a legal system the way the Oiran were. They, they were basically free agents. Um, some of them were employed by pleasure houses that were situated on the Chahar Bagh, but their employment at, at, at those pleasure houses was at will employment. Um, so they had the ability at, at any time to walk away and 
uh, no longer be associated with the household that they were associated with. Their clients were aristocrats and wealthy citizens and occasionally foreign dignitaries. But the thing about uh, foreign dignitaries as clients is that that was usually only reasonable if they either had an extravagant amount of money to spend or um, if they planned on living in Isfahan or, or elsewhere in, uh, in Persia for a significant period of time. Um, the, uh, the grace period required on either end was prohibitive enough um, that it added an enormous amount onto the cost. You weren't talking about just the cost of, of uh, you know, a single night with a high-end prostitute. You were talking about the cost of somewhere in the realm of three months at, at a minimum. Um, they were also extremely involved in charitable causes. Um, it, it, this is actually a feature of uh, courtesans that I didn't really get into in some of the other times, but in most times and places where courtesans were free agents, at least, um, there are a lot of records of their involvement in charity. Uh, it may be that this was in part a PR thing, that in order to be uh, tolerated by mainstream society, they went to great lengths to give back. Um, but one way or another, they did a lot of good for social causes. Uh, in Persia, they built schools and uh, they built orphanages. There's a, a you know wide range of institutions, mostly in Isfahan, that were built by uh, by the charity of the courtesans of Persia. So sort of fascinating. Some of them even built mosques, which again goes back to them being religiously sanctioned um, in a very surprising twist. Um, all right. Last but not least, we get to the Cortesiana, the courtesans of Italy. Now, I don't have as much to talk about with the courtesans of Italy because they're probably one of the best understood groups of courtesans um, uh, historically. I mean, it, the, the word courtesan actually comes from them. Uh, Italian courtesiana came from a lot of different social backgrounds, and they built really individualized careers for themselves based on those backgrounds and on their strengths and their talents. Um, but a lot of them were skilled writers, singers, actors, and entertainers. And that's the only part of it I'm going to really address today. The Cortigiana had central roles in the development of both Commedia dell'arte and early opera. And those particular um, aspects of, of their contribution, uh, I think, are often given sort of the short end of the stick. When, uh, when in fact they were hugely influential in the development of what we think of today as sort of the Western high arts. Um, so one of the things that happened is in the mid 16th century, the laws governing, um, I wrote the city states, but I actually meant Venice's. Uh, in the mid 16th century, the laws governing Venice's, Venice's courtesans became increasingly draconian. And a lot of Venetian courtesans got sick of it and left for Rome. And in Rome, in the 1550s to the 1570s, was springing up the um, uh, sort of renaissance uh, of Commedia dell'arte. I mean, obviously, we're in the Italian renaissance. But um, Commedia dell'arte had earlier roots, but it was really becoming um, a major entertainment uh, entertainment that you could find almost anywhere in Italy, especially in Rome, in the 1550s to the 1570s. That was when it really bloomed. And a lot of courtesans came from Venice to, uh, to Rome and became involved in the Commedia dell'arte. And some of the most famous Commedia dell'arte actors in the period were courtesans. Um, another way in which the courtesana were involved in the arts is that uh, a lot of them were trained as lutenists and singers. Um, they were known to perform in sort of salons in their, in their homes. Uh, but also some of them appeared in Jacopo Perry and Claudio Monteverdi's first operas. Uh, the first opera was written in 1594. Um, that's when we 
first uh, experienced the, the phenomenon that we know as opera. There are earlier roots, but um, in that first opera, I, I believe there are there were three courtesans who appeared in the first opera, um, and Monteverdi's operas from you know sixteen hundred through to about sixteen forty eight. Uh, also included a very large number of women on the stage, which, as you may know, was not the norm in a lot of Europe at that time. Um, but one of the ways around the respectability argument were that the women who were on stage were frequently courtesans. Um, there were also other courtesans who declined to pursue careers on the stage, but nonetheless sang and formed on the lute, especially to entertain their clients. So it was a, a part of the whole package of, of being a civilized, well-spoken um, young woman who was able to entertain. Um, part of that included being able to sing a, a song or three. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's my survey for today. Uh, there's a lot of other groups there. there the Chinese courtesans were also involved in the development of Chinese opera. Um, there are various other groups of, of courtesans throughout history who have had uh, significant roles in the performing arts. But this is, uh, this is all I, I intended to cover for today. If anyone has any questions, I, uh, I would love to hear them. Anyone? Thoughts, questions? If you're having trouble unmuting, you can post in chat and we can help get you sorted. Oh, I do have a question. Sure. Oh, sorry, though. Give me one a moment. Um, sure. One question that I do have is I'm seeing a massive parallel where in a lot of period we're seeing, oh, I'm sorry, real life stuff. Um, one common thing that I'm seeing through a lot of the different traditions around the world is that courtesans are performing artists as much as they are, as much as they are anything else. Yeah. If I might ask, are they, is like the courtesans considered, hold on, hold on. I'm terribly sorry about that. I'm working on something else that I, sorry. On, but the one thing that I was trying to ask is, so are courtesans typically what we're going to be seeing as the basis for for as the basis for female performers in period, as opposed to like with men, we had like professional acting troops and everything like that. But they were considered their own separate thing. Were courtesans like the primary performers that were female during the period? It depends on the time and place, uh, but in a lot of places, yes. Um, the deciding factor in that tends to be. Um, is there any other avenue in society for a woman to, um, to gain entree onto the stage, right? So if you're in a place like Persia where women aren't allowed to cross paths with men in any capacity, um, then that's gonna be a, a, a situation in which, yes, all of the entertainers that you're gonna experience are going to be considered part of uh, part of that class. Does that make sense? It definitely does. It definitely makes sense. Thank you so very much. No problem. Um, I got in a little late. I was having technological problems. So oh, sure. I arrived during the slide of the Greek uh, dancers and the long quote from a book. And without telling me everything that came before, how many slides were before that? Just one. You only missed one slide. <sighs> okay. This was just a fantastic, fabulous class. This is just Oh, thank wonderful. you so much. And I'm so sorry for my mistake. I, I noticed it this morning. Nah, stuff happens. It's just I don't like other people to get confused. I know no, you No, no, I, I appreciate that. I should have seen that, frankly, but it was like four o'clock in the morning when I put that in. <laughs> yeah, I know I put a class together and I caught all the typos as I was presenting it. <laughs> But thank you. It was wonderful. Um, I will make this, uh, the, the slideshow that you saw, it's actually just a, a, um, a PDF. I, I will make that available. I'll put it up on the, um, well, 
I'm going to put it up in the, in the known world courtesans group, but I know not all of you are in that group. So if, if you want to send me a, a private message on Facebook or send me an email at house of the Lotus at gmail.com, I will send you, um, the, the PDF if you'd like to have that. And I saw in the notes, somebody asked me for my bibliography and yes, I can absolutely send you, I have like a super long personal bibliography. I didn't bother putting my citations into this because I was doing it at the last minute, but I would be absolutely happy uh, to, to send you a list of resources. Um, and there's a lot of them. So uh, happy to do that. Anybody else? Do we have any documentation on what their training was specifically? Like what, how, what did they have to do to become excellent conversationalists in any period, in any place? So we do have documentation, excellent documentation in some places and very little in others. Uh, our documentation for the Heteri is really minimal. We know they existed and we have all sorts of pictures of them and people commenting on them, but we don't know really anything about their training. Um, we know quite a lot about the way uh, the Devadasi and Rajadasi and Talwain were educated. We know quite a lot about the way the Kisain were, were educated as well. It, it just sort of depends on what kind of records exist. Uh, the Persians, we only have secondhand records. They're like the, the Greeks, even though they're much later period. Um, we don't have internal records from the courtesans of Persia. All we have are outsiders saying, hey, this is what I, uh, this is what I saw and this is what I experienced, which doesn't tell us a lot about, about their backgrounds. So, um, so it's, it's very individualized. As far as becoming good conversationalists, in most places, that was a question of a liberal arts education. Um, they were trained on current events. They were uh, sometimes taught elements of, of rhetoric. Um, there was a, a nice little range of, of uh, educational background that were considered important to become a sparkling conversationalist. But uh, I think it was also considered to be a talent and one of the things that separated the more successful from the less successful courtesans. Thank you. All right, anybody else have any questions? I'm just gonna reiterate how fabulous this was. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really gratified that you guys have enjoyed it. Um, please come back at eight o'clock tonight. There's gonna be a lovely performance featuring some of the courtesans from around the known world. Um, and uh, highlighting a bunch of Eastern courtesans in particular. So please come by for that. Um, and uh, I, I got a message from somebody who remembers me from, from Leon Demir. Hi, Cecilia. Um, I, uh, uh, I am not in Starkoffin anymore. I am in the East Kingdom now, uh, living in the Crown Province of the Scard. So um, send me a, a PM on Facebook if you want to chat. And I'm an open book. Anybody who wants to talk, uh, who wants more information, anything else, please feel free to contact me. I'm Krishna Alexandra on Facebook, and you can send me a private message on Facebook, and I will reply. So um, it's nice uh, having all of you. And um, yeah, we're off about 13 minutes early. So enjoy your extra 13 minutes. <laughs> and if, if you want to get in touch with her, um, your Facebook profile is actually linked from the known world courtesans.org um, courtesan college uh, uh, class listing. Um, so if you go there, you can simply click on her name and it will take you right to Facebook so you can get connected. Perfect. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody. It was lovely seeing you. And especially for the person who wanted uh, a bibliography, just shoot me an email or a PM and I'll make sure to get it to you. All right. Bye, everybody.